It's like an enormous birthday cake, is it not? So strange and so out of place in this beautiful neighborhood. Near the end of the last century, when it was being built, so many of the great artists, they lived here. Oh, yes. Renoir, Manet, Van Gogh, so many. It amuses me to imagine their dismay as they saw it being constructed. Well, actually, I think it's rather beautiful. <laughs> you know, when they lived here, Mademoiselle, Montmartre was just a village in the countryside. Strange church for a village, I suppose. However, for myself, I am very happy that it is no longer the countryside. I greatly prefer, under my feet, the paving stones. Excuse me. spend the afternoon shopping. There are so many gorgeous shops in Paris, it's quite absurd. We've already bought the tickets, darling. It is where we came, Cecily. Yes, Venetia, thank you. I do realise. But I didn't realise we'd spent the whole week watching tennis. For goodness sake. Well, really. I do think Frenchmen are so rude, don't you, Venetia? Where's Madeline? Madeline? Fetch my cigarettes, will you? Yes, Lady Aubrey. Thank you. 
Monsieur Péry. Monsieur Péry mène par quatre jeux à trois dans le premier set. He was jolly good. Even you must admit, Cecily. Who was? Fred Perry, darling. The English one. I wish I'd seen Perry at Wimbledon last year. They say he was marvellous. Well, let's hope he wins again in the final. Yes, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Hello. Hello. I felt I ought to apologise, in case my clapping deafened you. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry. Do you enjoy the game? Oh, yes. It's a wonderful tournament, isn't it? I'm Norman Gale. Jane Grey. Wasn't she a queen or something? Briefly. No relation, I'm afraid. I'm just an air stewardess. Well, I hope you're not flying back before the final. Oh, no, no, definitely not. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Good. Garçon. Garçon. Oh, it's sick. Lovely dinner. Thank you, Stephen. Glad you enjoyed it. You mustn't worry about Cecily not turning up. Really? There's probably a perfectly good reason. She's probably back at the hotel now. She's been worse than ever this week. It was marvellous that you could come with us, Venetia. I'm very good at being a friend of the family. It's my role in life, I think. Oh. Good evening. Can't you sleep? It's three o'clock. Is it? Did you see her? Who? That woman. I might have paid her just a little visit, Stephen. On the other hand, I might not. I suppose you went to the casino. I might have spent just a few francs, yes, Stephen, I must confess. I'm not helping any more, Cecily. I'm simply not. You'll just have to tell her. 
Don't get so excited, darling. You and Venetia love riding around on horses. And I love smoking and drinking and losing money at the roulette table. So long as we all leave each other to our own devices, I don't see what the problem is. I'm going back to London in the morning. I miss the final. What will Venetia think? Mademoiselle, I did not take you for an admirer of the avant-garde. Hello again. Hello. You are a little baffled by what you see? Yes, I I'm afraid I am, actually. Well, it's hardly surprising, Mademoiselle. The surrealists, you see, they free themselves from the demands of logic. They do not paint what we see before us, the real world, as we call it. No, no, no. Now, they struggle to express the unconscious. The dream world. Though one cannot approach the work in a way that has logic. You have to experience it. You have to open your mind to it. That is all. Come, I will show you more. So, Mademoiselle Gray, how does the world look now that the surrealists have opened your mind to it? It's all looking a little strange now, actually. But I'm sure it's only temporary. It's been fascinating meeting you, Mr. Poirot. Ah, oh, no, 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 no. You are too kind. No, it has. But now there's a little bit of Paris I'd like to show you. Somewhere I'm almost sure you've never been. Oh, I've seen much of Paris, Mademoiselle Gray. Do not be so sure. Very clever, Mademoiselle Gray, to obtain from your seat at such short notice. That's your seat there. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You are too kind. I'll see you later. Indeed. Au revoir. Au revoir. Excuse me. Pardon. I really don't know why you're staying, Cecily. Why didn't you go back with Stephen? Perhaps because even this is preferable to being stuck in the country with all that mud and horse manure. Oh, you must have known what it was like before you married him. One never knows what one's husband is like before one marries him. That's one of the problems with marriage. staying for other reasons. What do you mean? What about that actor friend of yours? Isn't he keen on tennis?
It is interesting, is it not, how the British regard tennis as their own invention, and any tennis trophy is rightfully theirs? When the truth is, it was a French game originally. Jeu de Pomme, 11th century, I think. It was a jolly good game, wasn't it? And Perry absolutely thrashed Von Crane. Are either of you going to Wimbledon? For myself, I think not. Depends if I can get the time off. Me too. Garçon! Garçon! <laughs> You've had enough, Cecily. I have nothing for you. Nothing. Do you hear? The cupboard is bare. No more money. Comprenez? Pardon. Morning, sir. Welcome aboard. I hear Miss Gray will be travelling with us, ready to cater for our every need. How delightful. A little party. Ah, and there are two more to join us. Two more aficionados of the game of tennis. Oh, yes. Yes, I saw them yesterday. What a coincidence. No, 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 Monsieur Gale. It is not a coincidence. You will go to Paris for the tennis. The tennis finishes, you go home. What could be more logical? Bonjour, Monsieur. Le bouger, s'il vous plaît. Good morning, sir. Good morning. It'll be in here, sir, if you need it. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. You're at the end, Mr. Gale, on the right. Call me Norman, if you like. I shall have a rug, if I may. Thank you. Uh, your hat, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. This way, ladies. Ooh. Lady Aubrey. Miss Kerr. Is everything all right, Mr. Dupont? Yes. Would you like me to take your case for you? No, no. It contains valuable archaeological pieces. Equatorial African pipes, you see? For a lecture I'm giving to the British Archaeological Society. Really? How interesting. If you'll excuse me. This way, madam. Excuse me for asking, sir. But I couldn't help wondering. Would you by any chance be Mr. Daniel Clancy, the detective writer? Yes, yes, indeed. I'd just like to say, sir, I'm a great admirer of your Wilbraham Rice stories. He's so brilliant. A real genius. The way he can always work out who did it. Yes. So I don't know how he does it myself sometimes. Ow! My fingernail. Stuart! Steward! What can I do for you, madam? Get me my maid. She's in the other compartment. Tell her to bring my dressing case. Yes, madam.
Bill. No, I am not all right. Thank you. How can I be all right? Would you like something to drink, sir? No, thank you. Mon estomac. My throat. Of course not, dear. I'm 
afraid she's dead. What, what is it, a fit? No. No, I think not. Forgot it. It's a wasp sting. I killed a wasp with my cup. Yes, I saw it too. People do die of wasp stings. You must get back to your seats, please, gentlemen. We're about to land. Kiskasiga, sir. Another wasp. Yes, it is very like a wasp. But it is not a wasp. Goodness, it's a dart. A native dart. South American, I think. You have seen one of these before, monsieur? Yes, yes, indeed. But be careful. Yes, you are right. We must be very careful. Because unless I'm very much mistaken, mes amis, the end is coated with poison. Extremely sorry, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, police won't keep you very long. Uh, they'll let you go as soon as they've gone through your hand luggage. Excuse me, Mr. Poirot. Yes. Would you mind stepping outside? Not at all. I knew there was something suspicious about him. Didn't I say? Thank you. Well, well. Seems you can't even fly on an aeroplane now without somebody getting murdered. I've been onto the Surete in Paris. I spoke to a chap called Fournier. Inspector Fournier? No. I asked him to find out about the murdered woman, but he knew all about her already. Her name's Giselle. Marie Giselle. Well known money lender. Specialised in lending to society people. Always kept an ear open for their latest scandals and then used them to blackmail them when they got behind with their payments. Anyway, what can you tell me? I gather you were sitting just a few yards from the scene of a crime. Well, unfortunately, Chief Inspector Jap, at the time of the murder, I was asleep. Asleep? Really? Oh, well, well. <laughs> Still, I dare say you have a theory or two about who committed it. How could I possibly have a theory, Chief Inspector, when I still do not fully comprehend what happened? A bit odd, though, don't you think? Death by poison dart on a British aeroplane? Bizarre, isn't the word? John Dupont. Large book. In French. Cigarette holder. Ivory, I should say. Small notebook. Full of scribbled notes. Ornamental hollow tubes. African pipes, I think you will find. I was not asleep all of the time, Chief Inspector. I heard Monsieur Dupont tell it to the air stewardess, Mademoiselle Jane Grey. But Monsieur Dupont, he is an archaeologist. Could be what we're after. What exactly are you after, Chief Inspector? Well, the question I'm asking myself, Poirot, is how did the dart get into the body? You refer, I assume, to the method used by the South American Indians who shoot the native thorn, such as was discovered by the body, through the wooden tube, n'est-ce pas? Well, yes. But how do you know about South American Indians? Because I have talked to Monsieur Daniel Clancy, the well-known writer of the detective stories, and creator of the celebrated gentleman detective, Monsieur Wilbraham Rice. No? Hello? 
Well, Monsieur Clancy was one of the passengers on the aeroplane. He has researched into the subject for one of his books. Well, has he? Oui. Well, so he tells me. If you please, Chief Inspector, when you are finished, could you let me have a copy of the list of the personal effects of each passenger? It would be of great interest to me. Well, why would that interest you? What are you looking for? I do not know. All I know is that I pursue the object that will hold the answer to a question that troubles me. But such are the dilemmas with which we daily struggle, are they not? Hmm. Excuse me. Very helpful. Norman Gale, Strand Magazine. England's glory box of matches, empty. One white linen coat. Two dental mirrors. Dental rolls of cotton wool. You reckon he's a dentist by any chance? It's an unforgivable invasion of privacy. I demand to speak to my husband and my lawyer at once. It won't do any good, Cecily. It's perfectly normal procedure, I think you'll find. After all, the murder weapon might still be concealed in someone's bag or cage. Just take me to a telephone. This way, madam. You stay here. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, sir, but nobody's allowed on the plane. Those are my orders. We need to get on board. I've strict instructions. I'm sorry. But we haven't cleared up in there. There's coffee cups and goodness knows what. He won't let us on board. Oh, dear. Ridiculous. In all the time I've worked here. Yeah, if you please, Monsieur Major. Will you excuse us, Constable? One moment, if you please. I have a question, if you would be so good. Did either of you during the flight see a wasp? I saw the squashed wasp, yes, sir. In the young Frenchman's saucer when I gave him more coffee. But did you see the wasp alive? Uh, did either of you see the wasp flying around the cabin? No. No, I can't say I did. Well, nor did I. But surely it was the dart that killed the poor woman. Hasn't that been established? Almost certainly, yes, mademoiselle. Well, then why... Mademoiselle Gray, when was the last time you saw to be alive Madame Giselle? I suppose when I collected up the plates after the meal. And she was alive when I poured her coffee. A few minutes later, that would be. Merci. Merci, bien. Just one more question. Madame Giselle, had she ever flown with you before? I'd never seen her. But I've only been working here a few weeks. Ah, yes, of course. And you, monsieur? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, she flew with us quite often. She usually went on the first plane in the morning, the nine o'clock. This one sometimes gets busy, but there's always room at the nine o'clock. They found something, Poirot. You'd better come along with me. Thank you very much. A wooden pipe, Poirot. So I see Chief Inspector. Just what I was looking for. All we need to know now is how it got here. You see the markings? I think you will find that it is South American, just as is the dart. What's that you've got? I do not know. But I am sure all will be coming. The wooden tube is rather beautiful, is it not, Chief Inspector? Quite frankly, Poirot, I don't much care whether it's beautiful or South American. At the moment, I'd just like to know who was sitting here. Well, I was sitting here, Chief Inspector. Oh. Oh, well, uh, that puts a different complexion on it, I suppose. Men, no? Not at all. Check it for the fingerprints, if you please. I insist. I understand it is your duty, as a policeman of Scotland Yard, to regard everyone as guilty until he is proven to be innocent. No, no, really. And I tell you, Chief Inspector, I regard it as my duty 
to clear my name of this inexcusable slur as soon as possible. Stephen, I had to talk to you. I must warn you, something awful's happened. There's been a murder. Yes, on the plane. That Giselle woman. Inspecteur Fournier, sauté. Enchanté, inspecteur. I demand to speak to the person in charge. Sorry, madam. Don't, madam. Me. Do you know who I am? Really doesn't make going on? I think you will discover, Chief Inspector, that it is Lady Horbury. So you say, but I'm afraid I have strict instructions. Look, I've told you, madam. You cannot come on. I should talk to your superior. This lady is a policeman here. Chief Inspector Jeff, yes. I'd like to talk to you on your own. I wish to complain. If you just go back to the lounge, please, madam, I shall be questioning everyone shortly. Chief Inspector Jeff. I think it would be better to talk to Lady Hobbery now. She was sitting in the seat directly in front of mine. Oh, was she? Wait. Right. All right, Constable. Have you ever seen this before, Lady Hobbery? No, certainly not. Why? Lady Hobbery, at any time during the flight, did you see anyone move to the rear of the plane? What's it got to do with you? Just answer the question, please. No. I was sitting facing the front. How could I? I never left my seat. But I'm thinking about the last half hour in particular. Did you not notice anyone at all? No. Well, apart from the steward and stewardess, they were clearing the tables and then serving coffee. They passed by a few times. Did you see a wasp? Wasp? No. And did you know the murdered woman, Lady Holbrook? No. No, I'd never seen her before. Just when I thought we were getting somewhere. There is something that troubles you, Chief Inspector? I've just heard from Fournier. They've only just dragged themselves round to Giselle's house. By the time they got there, her blast had made her destroyed all her papers. Then perhaps it was the lunchtime when you informed them what happened. I beg your pardon? But it's very important in France, the lunchtime. But for the eating and afterwards the sleeping. Not for the catching of the criminals and the collecting of the evidence. Why do you need these papers, Chief Inspector? Because I think Lady Horbury knew Giselle. I could see it in her eyes. But I need proof. Well, I told them it's a waste of time looking through our luggage. Just because they've let us go, it doesn't mean they don't suspect one of us. Exactly. All it means is they couldn't find the evidence to keep us here. Excuse me, mademoiselle, that gentleman over there with the moustaches, can you tell me who he is? Yes, that's Hercule Poirot. He's the famous detective. Tell me, did either of you see anyone pass by Madame Giselle during the flight? Yes, I did. I was handing out the meals. I saw Mr. Clancy walk right by her. He was carrying a book. I assume he'd taken it from his bag or coat. He went straight back to his seat with it. Did he pose as he walked by? Or do anything in any way unusual? 
I don't think so. But I wasn't really concentrating on him. I'm still not used to the work. I was terrified of dropping the food. I see. And did either of you see anyone else get up? No. Well, actually, I got up myself, but only to go to the toilet. Which is at the other end of the cabin? Yeah. Vamos, Miss Yuge, to Shapura. What an impressive house. Yes. I wish I could say it was mine, but I'm afraid it's my uncle's. The surgery's here, too. We both work here. Well, goodbye. Ah, goodbye. I was wondering, are you possibly free for dinner? Perhaps tomorrow night? Goodness. Well, how lovely. Yes. Yes? Good. I'll telephone you tomorrow. You are thinking of Monsieur Guerre, mademoiselle? No, actually. I was thinking of Mr. Dupont. Ah, the archaeologist. Why is it that you think of him? Well... Because he came up and asked me who you were. It was a bit odd, that's all. And so you see, to Poirot, nobody is above suspicion. Well, I hope you don't think either of them killed the poor woman. Bonne fait, mademoiselle. Either could have done it. Merci. Monsieur Gale, because he could have had access to the poison, he would have known the doctors. For him, it would be easy. And Monsieur Dupont, because he travels around the world visiting the places exotic, he could have purchased the poison and the darts. And of course, he killed the wasp. But I thought Madame Giselle was killed with the dart. Yes, you are right, Mademoiselle. The wasp is not so much interesting as suggestive, I think. Mademoiselle Gray, would you be kind enough to help me? Mr. Poirot? Yes? I'm Lord Horbury. Ah, uh, yes. Please. Thank you. You see, my wife, well, in many ways, she's just not suited to the life I lead. It's a bit of a washout, really, our marriage. It's entirely my fault, I, I freely admit that. I fell for her, you see. Hook, line and sinker. Well, she was an actress. You know what actresses are like. No. What are actresses like, Lord Horbury? Well, um, all things to all men, in my experience. I mean, she played the country lady a bit to perfection, until she got bored with the part. So why do you come to me now, Lord Horbury? Well, we've had the police round already. I don't know how they found out, but they discovered she knew the murdered woman. And do you believe that this could have been sufficient justification for her to kill her? No. As I said, we don't get on. 
We don't get on at all. But God, I know what she's capable of. And she's not capable of murder. Never. We've been sitting here watching his house for an hour and a half. He's never going to turn up. Monsieur Clancy will turn up eventually, mademoiselle. Have no fear. There he is. Do not forget the shorthand, mademoiselle. But I told you I don't do shorthand. Neither I am sure does Monsieur Clancy. Just make the little squiggles with confidence. It will unnerve him. Monsieur Clancy, I confess, I am at a loss. I try to deduce who is the murderer of Madame Giselle, but there are several suspects. The little grey cells, never do they let me down, but in this case, pfft. And so in despair, I come to you. Why me? Because, Monsieur Clancy, I'm a great admirer of your detective, Monsieur Wilbraham Rice. Such logic, such a mind. Indeed, Monsieur Clancy, I have read everything that you have written. Now, Mademoiselle Grey here has agreed to assist me. I know that you will have some theory of your own about who committed the murder, if you would be so good to tell it. Then, Mademoiselle Grey will take it down so that I may absorb it later. I'm sorry, no, it's impossible. Oh, come, 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 Monsieur, you are too modest. I'm useless at this sort of thing. Wilbur does it, you see. He works it all out for me. It's quite brilliant. He was helping me only just now when I was out. We were retracing the steps of a murder. Terrible stabbing. Monsieur Clancy, I am talking about a real murder. And one of the chief suspects is yourself. Oh, yes. You had the opportunity. And you were observed to pass by Madame Giselle during the flight. I did not. But I saw you, Mr. Clancy. You were carrying a book. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> My Bradshaw. It keeps the railway times. Wilburn told me to go and get it, to check the villain's alibi. He was absolutely right. Really cracked it. I've never noticed it myself. Perhaps Monsieur Rice could solve another puzzle. You told to me that you knew of the South American Indians and their poison darts because of research for one of your books. Unfortunately, Monsieur Clancy, there is no mention of this subject in any of your books. But to my surprise, what do I see on your shelf? But this. With the powers invested in me by the Registrar of Paris, I now declare you man and wife. I do. Why? You're in charge of the Giselle case. Yes. My name is Anne. I'm Madame Giselle's daughter. And I've come to claim my inheritance. Ah, looking 
forward to the flight, Poirot. Gonna be a bit bumpy, they tell me. Gale force winds forecast over the channel. I have checked already, Chief Inspector. The air, it will be beautifully calm all of the day. Otherwise, I cancel my flight and you go on your own. Just a joke. Anyway, I've been talking to Lord and Lady Horbury again. I admire your industry, Chief Inspector. And Venetia Kerr. It's quite clear that Lady Horbury went off gambling every night in Paris and used to come back in a terrible state. But the morning before they left, she was particularly desperate. Which you assume is connected with Madame Giselle. And so we return to Paris to see what else we can find to finally incriminate the Lady Horbury. Well, yes, that's what we're going for, isn't it? Or have you got a completely different theory you're not telling me about? I am reaching certain conclusions, Chief Inspector. But conclusions which do not yet fit together, unfortunately. First, I conclude that the wasp is of vital importance. Yes, but she wasn't killed by the wasp. Forensic have already confirmed that. And secondly, the sudden appearance of the daughter of Madame Giselle, who we assume will inherit the money of her mother. Unless they find a will that says differently. Of course, it is possible that the daughter might be an imposter. Or perhaps Madame Giselle did not even have a daughter. Sir? Ah, would you care to order? Full English, please. <laughs> the use of your seat just for one moment. Thank you. Monsieur. Pardon? Where'd you get that? This? From Monsieur Daniel Clancy. It was in his house. That's evidence, Poirot. Hello, Chief Inspector. May I present it to you? For myself, I have no further use of it. exhibition of yourself here like you did on that plane. Well, my experiments were very useful, Chief Inspector. They showed how dangerous a woman is Lady Aubrey. Well, exactly. I mean, to be able to blow the poison dart from one end of the cabin to the other, first, she must have a lot of puff. Secondly, her aim must be as good as that of Fred Perry himself. And finally, she must have been able to become invisible so that no one on the plane saw her do it. I apologize, mon ami. Faro has gone too far. I'm surprised at you, Poirot. You of all people. I mean, what we're talking about here is the psychological moment, surely. Whoever murdered Giselle, whether it was Lady Horbury or even Daniel Clancy, clearly they chose just the psychological moment when no one was looking, so they could shoot the dart from wherever they wanted. Psychology. You are right, Chief Inspector. There must have been the reason psychological why no one on the plane saw the murderer. That is what we must discover. But first, we must talk to the daughter. If the daughter is what she really is. What do you mean, she's gone? She arranged to return here today where I agreed we would take further particulars. 
She was in such a hurry before, but she did not return. Well, let's go and find her, Fournier. How about that for a plan? That is the problem, you see. I do not know where. You mean you didn't take her address? No. After all, she came to claim her inheritance. <laughs> a very large amount of money, probably. Why should she not return? Chief Inspector, I would like it that you stay and work with Inspector Fournier, if you please. Uh. No, please, do not be difficult, Chief Inspector. We are in great need of the help of the showing. We've just had their help. Look where it's gone, us. Please, Chief Inspector, look. You remember that I removed from the wooden tube a tiny piece of paper. I have been studying it. Observe it, if you please. It has on it the little F, which I believe stands for francs. It is, I think, the remains of a price ticket which has been torn off. Therefore, the wooden tube, it was purchased from a shop in Paris, probably. I thought it came from a South American Indian. No. But now we have the need to discover where then is this shop. And Inspector Fournier and his men will help you to find it. What are you going to do? The first I must rest the little crescents. And then I pursue the matter of the disappearing daughter. Bonjour. Bonjour. Un homme a réserve une chambre pour moi. Il s'appelle Poirot. Ah, yes, of course. Monsieur Hercule Poirot. And you are Miss Gray? Yes. Thank you. How do you do, Miss Gray? Do, Mr. Dupont. What a surprise. Where are we going? I want to show you some of the remarkable things that archaeologists have in the past unearthed, Miss Gray. Oh, wait a minute. This is ridiculous. How did you know where to find me, Mr. Dupont? It was easy. I telephoned the airline. I said that I was your brother, that I urgently needed to contact you. But why? Because I need your help. anything like this? Not personally, no. Not yet. My father, he was the expert. He devoted his life to the study of equatorial Africa. Last year he died. So this year I plan an expedition there to continue his work. What a good idea. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have no money. I need money to fund the expedition. I look for private donations, but the average person, it is terrible. They care nothing about primitive culture. I hope you don't think I've got any money. I wish I had. No, no, it is not you, Mademoiselle Grey. It is the gentleman with the moustaches, Monsieur Poirot. He is a man of style, of culture. He has money, I think. You know him well? Not well, no. No, hardly at all. Oh. How unfortunate. I wish to ask if you would consider a small donation. Poirot? Give money to the digging up of Africa? Mon Dieu. Perhaps that is not such a bad idea. Voila, we are here. I will need your advice, mademoiselle. Why? How can I help? You are a daughter, are you not? We hear that Madame Giselle had a daughter, but perhaps this is wrong. This is an eerie place. So cold and unfriendly. Not what I would consider a home. I mean, there's nothing personal in it. Nothing at all. Mm, you're right. S'il vous plaît. There are no souvenirs, no photographs, no memories. Est-ce que Madame Giselle avait de la famille Elise? No, monsieur. Ses parents sont morts. Mort? What's she saying? That someone's dead? Her mistress has no family. Both her parents are dead. 
Avait-elle des enfants Non, aucun. And there are no children Non. c'est curieux, Lise. Une femme de le nom est Anne Giselle, vient de refaire son face. Anne Anne Giselle a refait sa face She knows the name. So Anne Giselle does exist. Est-ce que Anne est la fille de Madame Giselle Oui. C'était sa fille, illégitime. J'ai dû prendre soin d'elle pour Madame jusqu'à ce qu'elle s'en sépare. Il y a 23 ans, je ne l'ai jamais revue depuis. Le bébé de Madame Giselle était légitime. So that Elise had to take care of her. What did she say? Something about 23 years ago. It is 23 years that her mistress took the baby away from Elise and she has not seen her since. Merveilleux. The efficiency of the French police, no? Regarde, mon ami. What is it? It's a photograph of the daughter of Madame Giselle. Oh, marvellous. Be a great help in tracing of that, Will. Hold on, I've got some photos here. Excusez-moi. Have any of these people ever been here? Ah. Reconnaissez-vous quelqu'un, Alice? Encore une question, s'il vous plaît. Est-ce que vous qui avez réservé la place de Madame Giselle sur le vol? What are you asking? Oui. Alors pourquoi n'a-t-elle pas pris le vol de 9h du matin? Il était plein. Il n'y avait plus de place. I ask her why Madame Giselle did not take the morning flight as was usual for her. Why didn't she? Because the 9 o'clock flight, it was full, évidemment. There was no room on it. Well, I can't say further than that, can you? Qu'est-ce qui se passe? Hein? Ah, excusez-moi, madame. Oh, Qu'est-ce qu'il y a ici? Qu'est-ce que c'est de passe? Hein? Do you speak English? Quoi? Qu'est-ce que vous dites? Hein? English? Cecily. I don't worry. She's in bed. Fast asleep. It's been nice being out in the fresh air like this. It's the two of us, you mean? Yes. Yes, I suppose I do. Well, who knows? One day, well, maybe things will be simpler. Cecily did the decent thing, you mean? And what will the decent thing be, in your opinion, Venetia? Well, if she confessed, I suppose. Isn't that what we both want, really, Stephen? Yes, I know it's crackly. I'm talking from France. I want you to find Lady Cicely Horbury at once. H O R B for Bertie U R Y. Belgravia. Oh yes, and another place, big house in Suffolk. Well, look it up in the file. And don't lose sight of it. What? Yes. And ring me back as soon as you've traced her. Morning, Fournier. Sit down. So, what have you found out for me? I've been to see Madame Giselle's lawyer, Inspector. 
Chief Inspector. Uh, Chief Inspector, I have seen the will, and it is true. Uh, Madame Giselle left her daughter and Giselle all her money, except for a small amount for the maid, uh, Elise Grandier. I see. Thank you, Fournier. That is correct. The nine o'clock flight was full, so I booked Madame Giselle on the midday flight. How strange. <laughs> Why? What's strange about it? Flights are often booked up well in advance. But not this one, monsieur. <laughs> what do you mean? I'm an air stewardess. A colleague of mine was on the nine o'clock flight. She told me it was virtually empty. So perhaps you could now tell me the truth, monsieur. Well, it... Very well. A man came in. He gave me 4,000 francs to tell her the early plane was full. There didn't seem to be any harm in it. I didn't know she was going to be murdered. Describe this man, s'il vous plaît. He was an American, tall, young, with a goatee beard and uh, glasses. Thank you. Ah, yes. With glasses and a hat. And he chewed gum like all Americans. And his French accent. It was terrible. Of course. Bon. Look. I will show you the tray where I keep the wooden pipes. The junk tray, I call it. I keep it for all the Americans. No, 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 no. I bring it to you. Enjoy it, son. Yes, but there wasn't an American on board. So where has he come from? Mademoiselle, you have helped me very, very much. I thank you. I haven't done much. Oh, yes, already you are like a true professional. With a young man at the airline office, you played your role, but to perfection. Ah, the wooden tube. May I? Maybe. C'est joli, n'est-ce pas? Mais qu'est-ce que c'est? Ah, the little pieces of silk, such workmanship. What else do you observe, mademoiselle? Well, the silk is red. I thought the dart that killed Madame Giselle had black and yellow on it. But you see the murderer. He replaced the red silk with the black and yellow. You seem to be in a hurry, mademoiselle. Oh, not really. Well, Norman, Mr. Gale said he might call. He thought he might come over for a couple of days. I see. Um, mademoiselle Gray, I've been thinking, I've been thinking very hard. I wish that you say to Monsieur Dupont that Poirot is very happy to give to him for his expedition the sum of 500 pounds. 500 pounds? Oui. That's extremely kind. But of course. Oh. Ah. À la préfecture de police, s'il vous plaît. What if that woman Fournier let slip is not the real daughter, Poirot? Who else do we know? who is of an age that would be correct for the daughter of Madame Giselle, I tell you. We know three women, the Honorable Venetia Kerr, Mademoiselle Jane Grey, and the Lady Horbury. All three were on the aeroplane. Well, I'd still plump for Lady Horbury. But why, Chief Inspector? Well, for one thing, because that concierge at Giselle's finally admitted that she recognized her. She told you this? Said she'd been there several times. The last time she stormed out, slamming the door behind her. You discovered all this while knowing virtually no French? Chief Inspector, you're a miracle. Well, a bit of ingenuity, expressive hand gestures, that sort of thing. Thank you. We make progress, Fournier. Chief Inspector Jab believes that Lady Horbury committed a murder. Whilst I, I have discovered that the purchaser of the poison dart was a man. He can't have been. May we? An American. Or he seems to be. He chews gum, he wears the American spectacles, and speaks with a most terrible French accent. But it is easy to be an American in Paris, n'est-ce pas, Fournier? Mais oui, certainement. 
So I suggest that he is a stage American. You mean it was a disguise? So it cannot be Lady Horbury? Unless she has an accomplice. Now that is possible. Wasn't there some gossip about her in the newspapers? About her having an actor friend? Not in the newspapers that I read, Chief Inspector. But you may be right. Jap here. What? What do you mean? Well, where is she? Wonderful. I put a couple of men onto Lady Horbury, but it seems they were too late. They missed her. No one knows where she is. She's vanished. Oh, dear. So you have now a lost suspect too, Chief Inspector. Aren't you going to say hello to Norman? Ah. Uh, in such a situation, three is a considerable crowd, I think. Excuse me. Mr. Poirot. Oui. May I please? Please do. Thank you. No more murders, I hope, Monsieur Mitchell. <laughs> no. Bon. You know, it is truly fortunate to meet you here, Monsieur Mitchell. I have a question to ask you. When you cleared the table of Madame Giselle after she died, did you notice anything unusual? No. No, I don't think so. What sort of thing? Anything. Anything at all. Think hard, please. It is very important. Well, yes, there was something. It's silly, I'm sure, but... Um... There were two coffee spoons in a saucer. It can sometimes happen when you're in a rush, and it's better to lay too much than too little. People can get terribly irritable if everything isn't exactly right. Still, that's not what you're after. Au contraire, Monsieur Mitchell. Thank you very much. It is a clue of the most vital importance. It's so nice to be able to spend time together in Paris. Yes, it is. And I'll be fascinated to see where the old woman lived. Anyway, why do you think Poirot suddenly agreed to give to Paul the money? I don't know. Why do you think it's odd? Do you think he's worked out some theory? What? The Jean de Paul murdered Giselle. Do you believe he could have done it? I don't know. He's a bit funny. But he seemed quite nice to me. Oh, nice. Not that nice. This is her house. We're being watched. looking for Inspector Fournier. How can we help you, mademoiselle? Madame. Madame. Pardon. 
Well, I've come to apologise. You see, I came to see Inspector Fournier a little while ago about a rather important matter. You're Madame Giselle's daughter? Yes. Please, sit down, Madame. It's unforgivable, I know, but I was in such a frantic state. You see, I only read about her death the day I was going to get married. The minute the ceremony was finished, I hurried over here, and then I wished I hadn't. I felt awful about my poor husband just waiting for me, and we couldn't possibly cancel the honeymoon. So I just didn't come back. Until now, when the honeymoon has finished? Yes. Do you have any idea of the trouble you've caused, Mrs... Richards. I think we need a few facts. For a start, how do we know you're who you say you are? I thought of that. I bought you my birth certificate. Do I not know you, madame? There is something about you that I seem to recognise. I don't see how. I was brought up in Toronto after my mother abandoned me. Do you know Canada? Alas, no. Were you ever in contact with your mother, Mrs. Richards? Not at all. She never came to Canada to see me. She never wrote to me. She obviously didn't care at all about me. And naturally you hated her for this? I didn't care. That's all. Why should I? I just hope she's left me a lot of money. What's the matter? Nothing. What's money after all? Get me another drink, Raymond. Ah, is this the newspaper that you tell me about, Chief Inspector? The one that reveals the gossip of the English upper classes and their friends. Yes, and it's very difficult to get over here. So I see. The date is yesterday. Here, mon ami, the newspaper of today. Well, thanks. It's in French, Poirot. Struth, it's Lady Horbury. She disappears from her home in England, only to reappear here in Paris under our very noses. With, and let me translate for you, Chief Inspector. With her travelling companion, the well-known British actor, Mr. Raymond Barraclough. No, 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 please. Poirot has a plan. Is that all right? No. It is terrible. <laughs> Regardez. Well, she won't be able to recognize me. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Yes, but I did not intend that you should look like Santa Claus. Come, Monsieur Gale, into the next room and sit in that chair, if you please. Mademoiselle Gray, if you would be so kind as to hold the mirror. And monsieur, if you will hold the towel. Eh bien, do not worry. Hercule Poirot will make you look like a human being again. Daily Record, Paris Correspondent. I'm sorry to bother you, but we'd really like to do a piece on you for our series, The English in Paris. No, certainly not. No, really, Lady Horbury, the photographer will be here in just a second. Just a photo of yourself and Mr. Barraclough here. How dare you? Get away from us! Now, I really don't think you should be taking that attitude. We'll be here again tomorrow morning, Lady Horbury. I see we've got an excellent story here already. I'm sorry. Just leave me alone. You're pathetic.
Lady Hopper, bonjour. You care to join me? May I get you something? A coffee, perhaps? No. Thank you, I'm all right. A cigarette, perhaps? Thank you. There is something, perhaps, you would like to tell Poirot? And then he can help? No, it's nothing, really. But I think that is not so. On the day before the murder, your good friend, Monsieur Baraclough, he was in Paris? Yes. And you saw him while you were in Paris? And you also saw Madame Giselle, did you not? And she refused to release you from your gambling debts? I didn't know what to do. Stephen wouldn't pay them. I knew he wouldn't, not anymore. They were enormous. Much more than he imagined. She threatened me. She said she'd tell people about them. People in London. I've never been able to hold my head up again. So, the truth is that you and Monsieur Baraclough were delighted when she died? Yes. It was wonderful. It was too wonderful to believe. Ah, Poirot. Chief Inspector. Well, did you find out what you wanted? Yes. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Anyway, I must go. My nail. I must file it. What did you say, Mademoiselle? What? Oh, my nail. It's nothing. It needs filing. No, 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 no. Now I understand. Chief Inspector, get the taxi at once. Unless I am very much mistaken, Madame Richards, she's in great danger. to see him. And where did they go, madame? Can you tell us that? Oh, yes. He ordered a taxi for the Gare du Nord. They were going to England. I heard him tell her. My usual phone, ma'am. That is what the police suspect, Monsieur Gale. That's terrible. Wait. What about her husband? Has he been told? I believe the police have been unable to trace the whereabouts of Monsieur Richards. 
so far. Is there anything we can do to help? I regret that it is too late for anyone to help the daughter of Madame Giselle. However, if you both would be so kind, there is something you could do to help. Please join me in my suite, as I have called together all those I consider relevant to this case. Why? Well, surely you don't think... Mademoiselle, I think only of apprehending the murderer of Madame Giselle. I hope you only think of that also. Madame, Monsieur. First, I have the task to restore the reputation of Hercule Poirot, the celebrated detective who had the misfortune not to observe the cunning murder of Madame Marie Giselle, even though it took place not ten meters away from him. And so. When I had the dubious pleasure to attend the final of the tennis match, I observed an incident between you, Lady Aubrey, and Madame Giselle. It seemed to me quite clear that she had some hold of you. No more money, comprenez? A hold that you might go to any lengths to be rid of. Oh, now that is outrageous. Sicily would never be involved. Monsieur Raymond Baraclough. You are, I understand, an actor. A profession that I think would equip you very well for the impersonation of the mysterious American who seems to have been the accomplice of the murderer. And how are we supposed to have carried out this murder? Well, as for opportunity, the wooden tube was hidden in the gap next to your seat on the plane. But, as my experiments prove most conclusively, it would have been impossible for anyone to have blown the dart on the plane without the greatest risk of being seen. And so we ask ourselves, this question. Why was the wooden tube hidden in such a place where it would undoubtedly have been found? To mislead us. Vraiment, Chief Inspector. So next, we come to the wasp. What was the purpose of the wasp? The same thing. To mislead us as well. Thank you, Mademoiselle Grey. You know, Mademoiselle Grey has been such a help to me throughout. Une parfaite assistante. And she is right. But by the time the body of Madame Giselle was discovered, the wasp it was dead also, because it had been killed by Monsieur Dupont. It was buzzing around my coffee. But did you have to kill it, sir? Was that really necessary? <laughs> what? Are you saying that because I killed a wasp, I also killed Madame Giselle? <laughs> that is ridiculous. If the wasp was put there to mislead us, was there not also a danger of it failing to do so? Unless, of course, our attention was drawn to it by the murderer himself. It's a wasp sting. I killed a wasp with my cup. All I did was kill a wasp with my cup. However, Madame and Monsieur, we know that the murder it was not committed by the wasp. And we know that it was not committed by the use of the wooden tube. No. It was committed by the poison dart being pushed into the neck of Madame Giselle by the hand. Now, we know of only three people who passed by Madame Giselle during the flight. The two air stewards, Monsieur Mitchell and Mademoiselle Jane Grey, and Monsieur Daniel Clancy. Oh, no, really, I didn't come all this way to... So why did you come all this way, Mr Clancy? Because it would have been too suspicious to have refused? How dare you? Monsieur Clancy displayed an expert knowledge of the murder weapon. Goodness, it's a dart. Native dart. And in his house, I found a wooden tube very similar to the one we discovered on the plane. I told you. It was for a search, for a book. For a book that you never wrote, Monsieur Clancy. Because Wilbraham wouldn't let me. He thought the whole idea preposterous. How can I write a detective story when my detective refuses to take any part in it? What's he talking about? 
I fear that Monsieur Clancy suffers from a malady common to many writers of fiction. His characters, they take control. At times, they appear to him more real than the world around him. You mean he's a madman? A murdering madman. Keep him away from me. Please, Lady Horbury. Rest calm. Now, as for the two air stewards, I have already discounted Monsieur Mitchell. Well, that only seems to leave you, Miss Gray, wouldn't you say? Now, look, I'm sorry I protest. This is past a joke. No. It's all right, Norman. I was indeed suspicious of Mademoiselle Gray. I was suspicious of her new friendship with Monsieur Gale. Was his friendship really new? Or was she the true daughter of Madame Giselle? But then, of course, at last, we met the real daughter of Madame Giselle. As soon as she entered the room... I was looking for Inspector Fournier. I was convinced I had seen this lady somewhere Madame. before. It was not until Mademoiselle Grey caught her nail that I remembered. I must file it. In the lobby of the hotel, when I first saw Lady Horbury, she was accompanied by her maid. Fetch my cigarettes, will you? Yes, Lady Horbury. On the plane, when she called out for the nail file, it was brought to her by the same maid, a lady that we later came to know as Anne Giselle. I've come to claim my inheritance. This is all very ingenious, but I'm afraid Monsieur Poirot doesn't really mean it. He keeps deliberately changing his story. First, poor Jane killed Giselle. And now, her daughter did. No, 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 Monsieur Gale. The daughter did not kill the mother. The maid of Lady Horbury, she left the first-class cabin at the start of the flight, and we know that Madame Giselle did not die until shortly before we landed. Then how did she die? Hmm. You will recall, Monsieur Gale, that I asked you to disguise yourself as a reporter to go to see Lady Horbury. We'd really like to do a piece on you for our series. Was, he was... I apologize for the deceit, madame. But you know, at first, the disguise of Monsieur Gale, it was hopelessly unconvincing. Huh? But why? Why was the disguise of Monsieur Gale so unconvincing? There are two reasons for this. First, to make me believe that it would be impossible for him to impersonate the mysterious American. And secondly, and most important of all, to ensure that I would never learn the truth about how this murder was committed. You see, in the list of the personal belongings of Monsieur Gale, I had already noticed that he was traveling with his dentist's coat. During the flight, when coffee had been served and the air stewards were in another part of the plane, Monsieur Gale makes the visit to the toilet. He changes into his dentist's coat and alters his appearance with the help of some cotton wool which he had brought for the purpose. a spoon which gives him the task of a steward to carry out and hurries down the corridor of the plane. He then pushes the poison thorn into the neck of Madame Marie Giselle. On his way back, while I was asleep, he put the wooden tube into the seat in front of mine. He then returned to the toilet and removed his disguise. Very good. Very good, Monsieur Poirot. You have thrown the real murderer completely off his guard. Now, could we have the real solution, please? I think you will find, Monsieur Gale, that the truth of how this crime began is even more intriguing. Anne Giselle hated her mother for abandoning her when she was a baby. She was brought up in Canada, 
and came to England to work as a maid. By coincidence, she came into the employment of Lady Horbury and began to move into the high society. Despite your humble profession, Monsieur Gale, you aspired yourself to this society. And no doubt it was on one such occasion that you met the maid of Lady Horbury. Your relationship, it developed. Until one day, this same maid told to you her secret. She pointed out to you her mother and told you of the power she had over Lady Horbury. Of course, after 23 years, Madame Giselle did not recognize her daughter. And luckily for you, her daughter hated her mother so much that she willingly agreed to your plan. To murder her in such a way that Lady Horbury would be blamed. He planned all that. I could have... I mean, the police, very nearly. With Madame Giselle dead, it was essential that Monsieur Gale should not be married to the daughter. Anne would claim her inheritance, but in the event of her death, her husband would receive the wealth of Madame Giselle. But then Monsieur Gale learned that I had met Anne in the office of Inspector Fournier. He ordered a taxi for the Gardenau. He was terrified that I might discover that also she was the maid. You see, you left your fingerprints on the poison bottle. Now, that's absolutely ridiculous, because I will... You wore the gloves when you committed the murder. Indeed. Thank you. Come along with me, sir. Why? Why did you do it, Norman? For the money, Jane. For a very great deal of money. Why else? You liked Monsieur Gabe? Yes. And you thought that he liked you? But you are wrong, mademoiselle. Obviously. No, 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 no. He did not like you. He loved you. It is true. I see it in the eyes. I was getting a bit worried there, Poirot, in case you'd done it after all. In your sleep, perhaps. Very droll, Chief Inspector. One thing I don't understand, though. What put you onto Norman Gale in the first place? In the first place? Eh bien. In the first place, I looked for the home of the Wasp. And in the belongings of Monsieur Gale, there was a matchbox. An empty matchbox. Parfait. So, where are you taking me, Poirot? little farewell lunch, I hope. Nice little restaurant you've just discovered. I'm getting quite keen on this French food, you know. Not exactly, Chief Inspector. 
food for the soul, mon ami. Like an enormous birthday cake, is it not? So strange and so out of place in this beautiful neighborhood. Near the end of the last century, when it was being built, so many of the great artists they lived here. Oh yes, Renoir, Manet, Van Gogh, so many. It amuses me to imagine their dismay as they saw it being constructed. Well, actually, I think it's rather beautiful. <laughs> you know, when they lived here, Mademoiselle. Montmartre was just a village in the countryside. A strange church for a village, I suppose. However, for myself, I am very happy that it is no longer the countryside. I greatly prefer, under my feet, the paving stones. Excuse me. Spend the afternoon shopping. 
There are so many gorgeous shops in Paris, it's quite absurd. We've already bought the tickets, darling. It is where we came, Cecily. Yes, Venetia, thank you. I do realise. But I didn't realise we'd spent the whole week watching tennis. For goodness sake. Well, really. I do think Frenchmen are so rude, don't you, Venetia? Where's Madeline? Madeline? Fetch my cigarettes, will you? Yes, Lady Aubrey. was jolly good. Even you must admit, Cecily. Who was? Fred Perry, darling. The English one. I wish I'd seen Perry at Wimbledon last year. They say he was marvellous. Well, let's hope he wins again in the final. Yes, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Hello. Hello. I felt I ought to apologise, in case my clapping deafened you. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry. Do you enjoy the game? Oh, yes. It's a wonderful tournament, isn't it? I'm Norman Gale. Jane Grey. Wasn't she a queen or something? Briefly. No relation, I'm afraid. I'm just an air stewardess. Well, I hope you're not flying back before the final. Oh, no, no, definitely not. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Good. Garçon. Garçon. Lovely dinner. Thank you, Stephen. Glad you enjoyed it. You mustn't worry about Cecily not turning up. Really? There's probably a perfectly good reason. She's probably back at the hotel now. She's been worse than ever this week. It was marvellous that you could come with us, Venetia. I'm very good at being a friend of the family. It's my role in life, I think. Oh. Good evening. Madame, Madame Giselle, s'il vous plaît. 
Look at me. darling. Can't you sleep? It's three o'clock. Is it? Did you see her? Who? That woman. I might have paid her just a little visit, Stephen. On the other hand, I might not. I suppose you went to the casino. I might have spent just a few francs, yes, Stephen, I must confess. I'm not helping any more, Cecily. I'm simply not. You'll just have to tell her. Oh, don't get so excited, darling. You and Venetia love riding around on horses. And I love smoking and drinking and losing money at the roulette table. So long as we all leave each other to our own devices, I don't see what the problem is. I'm going back to London in the morning. I miss the final. What will Venetia think? Mademoiselle, I did not take you for an admirer of the avant-garde. Hello again. Hello. You are a little baffled by what you see? Yes, I I'm afraid I am, actually. Well, it's hardly surprising, Mademoiselle. The surrealists, you see, they free themselves from the demands of logic. They do not paint what we see before us, the real world, as we call it. No, no, no. Now, they struggle to express the unconscious the dream world, though one cannot approach their work in a way that has logic. You have to experience it, you have to open your mind to it, that is all. Come, I will show you more. So, Mademoiselle Gray, how does the world look now that the surrealists have opened your mind to it? It's all looking a little strange now, actually, but I'm sure it's only temporary. It's been fascinating meeting you, Mr. Poirot. Ah, oh, no, 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 no. You are too kind. No, it has. But now there's a little bit of Paris I'd like to show you. Somewhere I'm almost sure you've never been. Oh, I've seen much of Paris, Mademoiselle Gray. Do not be so sure. Very clever, Mademoiselle Gray, to obtain for me a seat at such short notice. That's your seat there. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You are too kind. I'll see you later. Indeed. Au revoir. Yeah. 
I really don't know why you're staying, Cecily. Why didn't you go back with Stephen? Perhaps because even this is preferable to being stuck in the country with all that mud and horse manure. Oh, you must have known what it was like before you married him. One never knows what one's husband is like before one marries him. That's one of the problems with marriage. staying for other reasons what do you mean what about that actor friend of yours isn't he keen on tennis British regard tennis as their own invention, and any tennis trophy is rightfully theirs. When the truth is, it was a French game originally. Jeu de Pomme, 11th century, I think. It was a jolly good game, wasn't it? And Perry absolutely thrashed Von Cran. Why right, are you going to Wimbledon? For myself, I think not. Depends if I can get the time off. Me too. You've had enough, Cecily. I have nothing for you. Nothing. Do you hear? The cupboard is bare. No more money. Comprenez? How <laughs> dumb. So welcome aboard. I hear Miss Gray will be travelling with us, ready to cater for our every need. How delightful. A little party. Ah, and there are two more to join us. Two more aficionados of the game of tennis. Oh, yes. Yes, I saw them yesterday. What a coincidence. No, 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 Monsieur Gale. It is not a coincidence. You will go to Paris for the tennis. The tennis finishes, you go home. What could be more logical? Bonjour, Monsieur. Vous bougez, s'il vous plaît. Good morning, sir. Good morning. It'll be in here, sir, if you need it. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. You're at the end, Mr. Gale, on the right. Call me Norman, if you like. I should have a rug, if I may. Thank you. Uh, your hat, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. This way, ladies. Oh. Lady Horbury, Miss Kerr.
Is everything all right, Mr. Dupont? Yes. Would you like me to take your case for you? No, no. It contains valuable archaeological pieces. Equatorial African pipes, you see? For a lecture I'm giving to the British Archaeological Society. Really? How interesting. If you'll excuse me. This way, madam. Excuse me for asking, sir. But I couldn't help wondering. Would you by any chance be Mr. Daniel Clancy, the detective writer? Yes, yes, indeed. I'd just like to say, sir, I'm a great admirer of your Wilbraham Rice stories. He's so brilliant. A real genius. The way he can always work out who did it. Yes. So I don't know how he does it myself sometimes. Ow! My fingernail. Steward! Steward! What can I do for you, madam? Get me my maid. She's in the other compartment. Tell her to bring my dressing case. Yes, madam. Right, sir. No, I am not all right. Thank you. How can I be all right? Would you like something to drink, sir? No, thank you. Money stomach. Cecily. My throat. 
course not, dear. It's a wasp sting. I killed a wasp with my cup. Yes, I saw it too. People do die of wasp stings. You must get back to your seats, please, gentlemen. We're about to land. Kiskasiga, sir. Another wasp. Yes, it is very like a wasp. But it is not a wasp. Goodness, it's a dart. A native dart. South American, I think. You have seen one of these before, monsieur? Yes, yes, indeed. But be careful. Yes, you are right. We must be very careful. Because unless I'm very much mistaken, mes amis, the end is coated with poison. Extremely sorry, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, police won't keep you very long. Uh, they'll let you go as soon as they've gone through your hand luggage. Excuse me, Mr. Poirot. Yes. Would you mind stepping outside? Not at all. I knew there was something suspicious about him. Didn't I say? Thank you. Well, well. Seems you can't even fly on an aeroplane now without somebody getting murdered. I've been onto the Surete in Paris. I spoke to a chap called Fournier. Inspector Fournier? No. I asked him to find out about the murdered woman, but he knew all about her already. Her name's Giselle. 
Marie Giselle, well-known money lender, specialised in lending to society people, always kept an ear open for their latest scandals and then used them to blackmail them when they got behind with their payments. Anyway, what can you tell me? I gather you were sitting just a few yards from the scene of a crime. Well, unfortunately, Chief Inspector Jap, at the time of the murder, I was asleep. Asleep? Really? Oh, well, well. <laughs> Still, I dare say you have a theory or two about who committed it. How could I possibly have a theory, Chief Inspector, when I still do not fully comprehend what happened? A bit odd, though, don't you think? Death by poison dart on a British aeroplane? Bizarre isn't the word. John Dupont. Large book. In French. Cigarette holder. Ivory, I should say. Small notebook. Full of scribbled notes. Ornamental hollow tubes. African pipes, I think you will find. I was not asleep all of the time, Chief Inspector. I heard Monsieur Dupont tell it to the air stewardess, Mademoiselle Jane Grey. But Monsieur Dupont, he is an archaeologist. Could be what we're after. What exactly are you after, Chief Inspector? Well, the question I'm asking myself, Poirot, is how did the dart get into the body? You refer, I assume, to the method used by the South American Indians who shoot the native thorn, such as was discovered by the body, through the wooden tube, n'est-ce pas? Well, yes. But how do you know about South American Indians? Because I have talked to Monsieur Daniel Clancy, the well-known writer of the detective stories, and creator of the celebrated gentleman detective, Monsieur Wilbraham Rice. No? 